Secretary General, thank you for talking to us. Um, Sri Lanka, uh, the, the summit that's going to be held there is going to be the first one since the Royal Charter was signed, which actually enshrines in writing what the Commonwealth stands for. And yet Sri Lanka is in contravention of just about every single one of those statements. It's not really a decision of the Secretary General. Over the last six years, on three occasions, the heads have met and discussed this request from Sri Lanka uh, to hold the summit in 2007. It was noted 2009. It was agreed upon 2011. Uh, it was reiterated. And the view of the heads was that the decision should be gone ahead with because it's, it's an event with a lot of, lot of consequences for the members, particularly the small states. But the point surely is that the question of whether a country is upholding the Commonwealth's principles is actually checked up upon by a group of eight foreign ministers representing CMAG, the Commonwealth uh, group that actually verifies whether a, a country is, is obeying these, these, these tenets. Now, um, they met in March, but they didn't know what you knew, which was that the president of Sri Lanka had uh, been in contravention of his own constitution, had acted unconstitutionally in getting rid of his Chief Justice. On the matter of the uh, dismissal and impeachment of the Chief Justice, I've been very clear in saying that this deviated from the Latimer House principles on separation of powers and the independence of the judiciary. Having well, said, breach of the rule of law. Yes, having said that in public, then I went to Sri Lanka and I went and, and met the interlocutors there, including the uh, Speaker of the Parliament, and carried persuasion that what they needed to do, in fact, was legislative uh, reform and systemic changes in order to bring this practice in line with Commonwealth practices. But that's after the horse has bolted. I mean, the fact is he sacked, quite unconstitutionally, the Chief Justice. And much more important, you were so alarmed that you actually called in two independent lawyers of enormously high stature uh, and your own lawyer from the Commonwealth Secretariat uh, and you, you, you had a look at this and you, they, they found that they, he was in contravention of the Constitution. The reason I did it was because I had said I will develop for them a recommendation as to what should be done based on the best legal brains in the Commonwealth and so this was an exercise which was done in confidence, an internal process, in order to develop, together with other contributions that I had, a plan which was to be submitted under what's, my, what's called my good offices to Sri Lanka to work on. So the president breaks the rule of law, you discover he most certainly has, and nothing happens to him. Well, what they have now is on the basis of the advice that I received legally, what I feel should be done in this field. That was really the purpose but, uh, of the this, exercise. This is cloud cuckoo land. Navi Pillay, the uh, person who is actually there for the United Nations to vet what's going on on the human rights front and indeed in the uh, whole way in which the country is developing, is saying it's descending into autocracy. And if anything, matters are getting worse. And yet this is the moment when you feel that the advice that you got from your lawyers should not even be put to the eight foreign ministers who right have to now, talk. The advice is with the consultative committee in the parliament and that is the purpose for which it was meant. This exercise. I'm talking, about the of, I'm talking about the Commonwealth of which you are the Secretary General. Eight foreign ministers had to meet in March to determine whether Sri Lanka was indeed in breach of these particular tenets of the Commonwealth. And they found they could not find because you would not tell them these, the legal advice you got. Why did you keep it from them? These ministers, in fact, have encouraged. But, but why did you keep your advice from them? Because it was done. In, a, in confidence in order to secure legal opinion on which I was constructing my good offices to be presented to a member state. But if these this foreign ministers had known, they would not have sanctioned the meeting to go ahead in Sri Lanka because that very month, in the presence of the Queen, you had signed this document, the Charter of the Commonwealth, a very important document which sets out that the rule of law, human rights, good governance, are the absolute tenets, democracy, by which the Commonwealth will judge a state. 
there is no state in the Commonwealth that is in greater breach of those four principles than Sri Lanka. And not, you want to go ahead with this, this summit? Was not a document which was public in nature at all. Well, it should it's be. an advice. It, should be. it is an advice with the Secretary General very often in the pursuit of the good offices of the Secretary General uh, secures in order to build that advice. How are these it ministers to make a judgment on Sri Lanka if they don't know what you know? Because I give them a report as to what my good offices are doing and they, they have full knowledge of what it is that is happening in respect of all the areas in which the Secretary General is working. Do you as Secretary General agree with the United Nations demand that there should be a full independent international inquiry into the killings at the end of the civil war in Sri Lanka? That is a, a subject which is being done and dealt with in another organization. No, 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 no. You live in the world. The Commonwealth you know, is part the of the world and the world organization, the United Nations, has said this must happen. Do you believe it should happen? What the United Nations have said is that by a certain time limit, which is April, investigation should happen if, uh, depending upon what, what point has been reached at that point of time. I respect the, the concerns and the values that are being expressed in this, and all the members that are present in the Commonwealth are also members there, so I am fully aware and respect the process that is happening there. But you have a third of the leaders of the world, well, with the big exception of Canada, a third of the, of the leaders of the world turning up um, in Sri Lanka before that April deadline, before the President has shown any sign whatever of agreeing to the demands of the United Nations. And in some way, you believe that for some reason the Commonwealth Secretariat is above any question of what the UN is concerned about. It's not, it's not above at all. It's just that every organization has its own points of strength and, and design to do a certain work in the field of human rights. Now these, these leaders can take a view on this issue in the United Nations context. What I do here in Sri Lanka is in fact pursuing on the coal face in Sri Lanka some very hard challenges in the field of um, torture for instance. We have the first time bound inquiry which will be done of state forces. But torture is still going on. 12,000 disappearances since the end of the war and they are continuing. Killings. Now this is not good enough, is it? And for you to put into the public arena the idea of a conference which is simply going to give a blessing to a man who is suspected of grievous war crimes is surely itself a crime. It's not sufficient to say that we are not doing anything there at all. We've I'm done, we've done this work on torture, we've done in reconciliation, problems, we've done a lot of work on moving forward with the human rights commissions on many fronts, we've done this work on uh, judicial with independence. What effect? With what effect? Now everything which you do with the member state does not, the results are not forthcoming overnight. I do realize that out there, there's a lot of skepticism which will get somewhere or not. But I think in the given period of time, which we have had, we've made very good progress. And of course, we have to keep on seeing that this progress is made. Where is, where, where is any kind of justice being brought to the families of those who've disappeared these last uh, three years, 12,000 people? Where is the justice to those people who lost the families two, and loved ones the in the massacres at the end of the, the war? The two processes that have been started by us, which is a national plan on reconciliation, which is being done by us, as well as this inquiry into torture will bring out the questions of truth, of accountability, and of disappearances. I firmly believe in the fact that unless you know the truth, and if you want healing, how can you have forgiveness? Well, we know the truth. The truth is that the president of Sri Lanka stands accused of very, very serious infringements of human rights, which have cost many, many lives. And he is going to be allowed to shake the hand of 50 leaders coming through. And in many ways, you've played a role in bringing that about. The decision, as I said, of holding this shogun belongs to the leaders. But at no point right you now, said, I don't think this should happen, this isn't good for the Commonwealth. I've never heard any what, of that from you. What is good for the Commonwealth is to engage in, in creating real progress and constructive progress in the areas of human rights, 
and the rule of law, which is what I'm engaged in. This is the strength, actually, of human rights work from the Secretariat. If you look at other cases, for instance, what we did in constitutional reform uh, in one country like Tonga, or constitutional reform in an African country in Swaziland, or indeed in Maldives, the gestation period of what we do takes a while. The problem at this point is that the man in charge, the man who has to do all this, is the man accused of these crimes. But we work, we will work with the chair in terms of the values and the, in the charter that you are holding, uh, looking forward to advancing these values in working with him. One of the most important countries in the Commonwealth, Canada, is refusing to go. And they're refusing to go in part because you didn't tell them about the legal advice you'd had concerning the president's extra constitutional, unconstitutional activity. This advice was procured for a particular, particular pr purpose for which it was used. Why do you think Canada pulled out then? Canada, from the public statements that Canada has made, it has said that it, it expected to see progress in human rights, which, of which, there's none. which, which uh, is not visible enough for the Prime Minister himself to go. Well, where is that evidence? Uh, could we not share it with you? Could you tell us? The points I have made about torture about reconciliation, How about the work we have done. When people are still being disappeared. That is, the that is the national inquiry with which we are associated, which is going to be done the with an advisory group. By the man who did it. No, the or Human Rights Commission is doing it yeah. with us, with an advisory group from the Commonwealth, in order to ensure that this exercise is a serious one. A very important point, always to keep in mind, that progress does not happen in a vacuum. It is, I have heard a lot, what is happening in Sri Lanka in this, that or the other. Progress can only be secured if institutions like the Human Rights Commission are strengthened and given the muscle and the spine in order to do their work. Which is why what we are doing moving forward is working with them. It's one of the big ambitions we have is to raise the status of the Human Rights Commission from what's called International Recognition B to A so that they are able to safeguard the interests, human right interests, of their own people. And we are working with them. Well, if you were able to persuade the uh, president of Sri Lanka to adhere to the call from the United Nations for a full international investigation into what is happening, then perhaps you'd be using some muscle. But there's no evidence you're going to do that. There are two channels here. One is that which is taking place in the United Nations in respect to the events of the conflict. The other one is the progress we are able to make in human rights and the rule of law on the ground, which becomes progressively visible. But you can see how viewers are going to find this very difficult to understand. On the one hand, the Chief Justice is sacked, and on the other hand, you have further disappearances. In this very month, disappearances. Well, very in this very month, gone. killings. Mm -hmm. In this very month, journalists who, who, who get disappeared. This isn't, this the, isn't an improvement in human rights. In the processes, that we are now setting in motion. And what the Human Rights Commission of Sri Lanka is also able to do. For instance, they made a recent announcement that if within a two week period, something which they have said does not happen, then law can st step in and they can take legal measures against it. In the end, it is always the Human Rights Commission which must be a guardian and a protector of the rights of the, the kind of rights which you are talking about. In well, fact, we have, I know you've got the charter in your hand. Mm. In fact, we are very shortly going to put up on our website information which in interestingly takes as a caption something which is in the charter in Brisbane and what we are doing in Sri Lanka and put there what we are doing. The, the grandeur of the meeting is going to drown any of the pictures, for example, that we've seen. Have you seen any of the films that we've put out about Sri Lanka? Yes, I have. And I must say feels? the images are disturbing. Well, that's an understatement, isn't it? I mean, it's shocking evidence, that's the problem. And it does seem to me as a final question that for a year in which you've actually produced this charter, in which the issues of human rights, democracy, rule of law, good governance, then find you within months staging an event like a Commonwealth summit in the middle of Sri Lanka, which is in, in, in disrespect of every one of these issues, it doesn't look good, does it? But in the time to come, I trust that the people will see 
And that is what we thought at that time. And looking at some of the initiatives that I have mentioned, and the fact that we are driving forward this agenda for the rule of law, democratic institutions, and human rights, that indeed very significant advances have been made in the interest of the citizens of Sri Lanka. Secretary General, thank you very much for talking to us.